want to know what you guys are building. So everyone that's in the Zoom chat and for people on the Instagram live that want to join the Zoom by clicking in my bio and hitting the links, you could come into the chat and you could let me know what you're working on. So let's see if I can see the chat for a sec here. So if anyone has a business that wants to share just briefly what that is, that would be such a benefit because then I can reference it the entire way through. And if you don't, I have to make up businesses. And my businesses are ridiculous. A popsicle stand, is that a real thing? I don't know. Illustrator. So we've got Natalie Very B. She's a professional illustrator. I've seen some of her work. It's fantastic. She draws the cutest everything and anything. Not professional, she says. I, I, I beg to differ. <laughs> Motivational rapper. Awesome. Very cool. You don't hear that often. Usually rappers are braggadocious and then uh, full of insults, but motivational rappers. Awesome. Behavior analyst we have here. Cool. And someone joining a startup in three weeks. Very cool. So that's just like a little bit of what you guys are working on, which, oh my God, rapper is probably one of the most difficult jobs because it means you're putting on every single type of hat and doing every single part of that until you can either get a manager, a lawyer, a label, et cetera, a street team. That takes so much time to build up to. So when people tell me like they're a rapper, I go, oh my God, I, I understand that you hustle very, very hard. So let's flip back into the screen share. So a great presentation is built on a basic formula, which is personal experience, relatable challenges, and engaging stories. The bonus point to that is if it's relevant to the current culture, that's fantastic. So things about Bitcoins, if it's about frontline workers, COVID, all that kind of stuff, then that is going to be such a beneficial item to be talking about or, or doing a presentation on. But if you're selling like old typewriters, uh, maybe not as relevant as you want. By the way, I have an old typewriter for sale. If anyone wants to hit me up in the chat either side, please, I, I got to unload this thing. It's the Z in the wire in the wrong spot because I bought a German keyboard by accident. <laughs> so having these three or 3.4 or three or four things helps you build a great presentation. So with that formula in mind, we start breaking it down of how to put that kind of stuff together. So you begin with the step-by-step step. and you're trying to figure out who is your audience? What do you want to say to them? Why do you want to say it? Why should your audience care? What will they learn from it? What action do you want them to take? What help sets you apart? Will this solve a problem for someone? What do you want them to feel? And will it make a difference to their lives? So that's a whole bunch of things. There's a few just up on the screen. If anyone wants to take a minute and throw an answer in the chat, that would be fantastic. If anyone's doing on the Instagram chat up here, I, I can't see you whatsoever because the phone is too far to my reach and I got terrible vision, as you could tell. But anyone in the Zoom chat, if you want to try and answer any of the questions you see up on the screen, like who is your audience or what do you want to say or what else we got up in here? What sets you apart? I would love to see a few of your responses and maybe someone from Arts of who can read them over to me so I can, uh, actually, I guess I can just click this button. Mm -hmm. Oh, no. Anyone at all? Businesses and organizations for youth. Awesome. So the motivational speaker, wait, that was him? Kasim? Is aiming at businesses, organizations, and youth. What about you, Natalie Very B? Who's your audience? Oh, put the screen back up. One sec. or what sets you apart, or what do you want people to feel when they get your art, when they get a package from you? Where's the button? Style, witchcraft, and stylized. Uh, what, what was that a reply to though? <laughs> Is that what set, probably what sets her apart? So she does a lot of feminine art, witchcraft, all kinds of awesome stuff like that. So just finding like, you don't have to answer, of course, all of these because it's like a list of what, six on the screen. I, I, I rattled off 12 of them. You don't always have to have a compelling answer to every single piece of this, but just trying to figure out one or two will help you get a better grasp on what your points are that you can better define and then begin to distill those down to a single point. So by the end of this stage, you no longer have a topic, but a single clear thought or argument that you want to communicate through your presentation, pitch, whatever it might be, keeping it simple and keeping it focused. So let's move along to the next piece. Oh, I'm in the not on screen share anymore. There we go. 
So the opening scene, getting the opening right is vital to the success of your presentation. If it's crafted mindfully, it lets your audience know that number one, they're definitely in the right place. They don't want to miss a word and that you have something to say that will make a difference to their lives. Of course, that's not going to apply to every single thing you create or write or do because not everyone's going to give a damn. Not everyone's interested in witchcraft art or they're not interested in motivational rappers. They're not interested in photographers or whatever it might be that you're putting out. But you're just trying to get as many ears as you possibly can to listen to you to find that one person that is connected to that or is interested in purchasing that or moving along or investing or whatever it might be. So you want to open with style and impact. I find so often when I see speakers and I see a lot of speakers, they begin with, <clears throat> uh, I'm sorry. And I'm like, mm, sorry, cool. Not a very powerful word to start off with. You really diminished yourself. I don't understand what you're apologizing for, but you've started with an apology. Uh, I'm not really the one supposed to be here. It was going to be the other guy. His, his cat got sick with diarrhea. I've just kind of stepped in to fill in for him. Oh, God, let me read through his notes. Oh, this ain't no good. I can't read any of that. You know, I spilled juice on this in the car. You know what? Um, here's uh, all the details about my business that are too boring to grab anyone's attention. I, I can't stand that. I see that happen so often. They just begin into these stories, sharing these dull little pieces of information. Your audience doesn't care. You want to catch their attention. And the best way to get people's attention is to where is it? open with a short, relevant, and interesting story. You can get people to laugh. You can ask them an obvious question or two. You can make a bold statement, surprise, intrigued, a fact, a stat, whatever it might be. You can command the use of their imagination or stimulate the mind, or you can participate together. You know why every single performer asks you to clap one more time because that first clap really wasn't worth a damn? That's just to get you to participate together, to put everyone on the same page, get all the attention, all the focus right on the performer at that time. Icebreakers. I didn't do an icebreaker because this because it's on digital, so it's not going to work out as well. But icebreakers are a fantastic way to engage your audience. Even asking a general question and then having them raise their hands as a reply is a fantastic way to kind of get people involved with you. What else do I have on my list over here? Mm -hmm. Giving real life examples. So I've seen Apple do this a ton of times where instead of saying like, oh, our new iPhone 29 is 3.1 millimeters thinner than the last iPhone 28. You're like, I don't know what a millimeter even is. I don't know how to measure. I dropped out of school. You give real life examples like this is as thin as a pencil. This is as thin as paper. This is two magazines stacked on top or whatever, whatever example you want to give. You could pass things around in your presentation for people to see, feel, touch, fiddle with, or offer a solution to their problems. If you can find a way to open your presentation with something people haven't already heard or experienced, that is a fantastic way to do it. One person I had seen when she did hers, she had taken a bunch of paper plates, painted one side green and one side red, put them under everyone's chair. And so that when she asked them a question, she's like, oh, reach under. She was like Oprah, basically. She's like, reach under your chair for a big surprise. It's a painted plate. And then people could answer yes and no questions with their green and red plates. Instant participation, instant fun. It was such a great way for her to gather data, just seeing people participate like that right on the spot kind of thing. Next slide. What was that about again? You'll see a lot of presentations in one day sometimes, whether it means you're at a business place or a pitch competition or whatever it might be. When you happen to see these things over and over again, you want it to be memorable. You want yours to stand out. And that's a difficult ask. It's a hard way to try and figure that out. But I've come up with a little acronym for you guys to kind of give your work a little bit of purpose. One being the primary effect. So when people ask later, like, what did you remember from that? The first thing you usually recall is what came first. So that's why the opening is such a critical thing when you begin to tell your story or engage your audience. You want to let them know what you're selling or what the hell you're talking about or what it is you are pitching for. Uh, U stands for unusual. So that means standing out, your outfit, your attitude, your style, your product, etc. Even right now, I'm wearing these white frame glass with red on the side. I look like a Canada flag hit me in the face. I, it's just part of what I do to stand out and be a little bit unusual. When I go into front of um, crowds, I try and wear a nicer shirt. Something I'm going to wear on date night is the exact same thing I'm going to wear for an audience when I'm pitching, presenting, or, or performing. R stands for repetition, although not like mindless repetition where you just keep saying that you're building a, something over and over and over again. You want to let your audience know what you're doing in the beginning, the middle, and the end. I see podcast commercials are the worst for this. They'll constantly say something like, 
we're the murder podcast. You know, like, cool, cool. Yeah, yeah, congratulations. And then they'll play you like a bunch of clips of all these little uh, murders they've solved and whatnot. And you're like, okay, I'm, it, I'm, Tiger King sounds cool. I want to know more about that. You're going to get pulled in. And at the end, they go, yeah, find us on the Apple iTunes store, or Stitcher, or wherever you get podcasts from. I'm like, cool. What was the name of your show, though? You, you said at the beginning, the cool, great choice. You left it out in the middle. You sold me on it. By the time I listened to your 30-second spot, I was sold on it. But by the time I got to the end, you didn't remind me again once more who you are so I know exactly what keyword to search. So you want that in there three times at least, front and the end, just so it makes sense that when you've sell them, sold them on this thing, the name comes right back into place. The next P, personalized. There's nothing really worse than being on the receiving end of generic information. So if you can personalize this, this means putting in your own personality, what you went through, your experiences is such a better way to show that kind of thing. And same with opening up matches right along with this. You want to open up. I talked about in the beginning, losing the $25,000. The first time I ever admitted that in front of an audience, it was like being punched in the gut. It was a terrible feeling. I felt that embarrassment. I, I felt that stupidity of what I had gone through the year before. But when you begin to open up, people begin to connect with you better. They see that you're vulnerable. They feel that. They, they see your anxieties. They see whatever you're going through and can kind of match that kind of feeling because they've had these, they possibly have had similar experiences. When you open up, it just makes for a better way to connect with people. And stories, S for purpose. Stories are such a great way to connect. I, I find it's what engages me the most. I when I go to events, it's the stories that draw me in, hearing what someone had gone through when they personalize it, they open up, they, they run me through the, the jokes or whatever they've built into these stories. I love that so much more than just facts and statistics. So if you can put your work into a story or, or attach it to a story of what you'd gone through, your own struggles, your own ups and downs, that's such a more beautiful way to make a pitch or a presentation. And of course, E for energy, enthusiasm, and excitement, which I'm filled with tons of over here. That's right, everyone over there and over and over here. If you go on the stage, you're like, yeah, I'm super excited to be here. Yeah, yeah, here we go. People are not going to be excited with you. You have to have that energy. You have to bring the ruckus when you get up there. If you want people to pay attention, you got to give them a reason to pay attention to you. And that is going to be in your energy. Even these, yeah, I'll get into it further and further, further into it a little bit later. Is PowerPoint still cool? I used to like to make fun of PowerPoint a whole lot because forever it just looked like a terrible Windows 98 product. I know this guy, Mark, knows what I'm talking about over here. <laughs> but PowerPoint's gotten a lot better, okay? They, they've, they've taken a lot of the horrible things out, like the star swipe nonsense. They've gotten rid of that, and they've improved so much on it. But having a visual aid is such a key element. So if you are doing a presentation and you've got access to – big ass flat screen or a projector or whatever it might be, you're going to want to use that because making it visual just adds so much more to a presentation. Mm. So a few questions you can ask yourself when considering you're adding a slide is because when you put a hundred slides in, it's just too much. People can't sit through a hundred slides is what useful purpose does this serve? And that does not include being a script for you. If you are reading off an entire page the whole way through, that is painful. That means anytime they do that, I go, cool, you've put your entire present up here. I'm going to read it through in 30 seconds because I'm a speed reader. What's up? Thanks, mom, for teaching me. And now I don't have to pay any attention to anything you're saying for the next six or seven minutes while you go through this entire paragraph up here. This is perfect. I can now play on my phone. I could, I could check email. I could do whatever I want. You do not want your script on a screen. You want to ask yourself, how will this help or engage my audience? And does it add value to my message? So some designer insights. Like I said, designer, 12 years. Look at these fancy glasses. Clearly a designer. It's a button-up shirt, facial hair, classic designer look over here. You can oops, wrong one. show a topic and a supporting image like a billboard, and you skip the details. So as you've seen through my presentation, as people on Instagram cannot see it whatsoever, is you just simply need to put up a statement. That's your talking point, and then you provide the information. That way no one is getting it ahead of you or they're not stealing the information before you can even tell it to them. That way they must pay attention. They have to have some level of focus as you go through this. So keeping things like a billboard, nice and simple. Picking two easy to read fonts. Number one, as you can see on my screen, I've got a bold headline font and then a nice easy to read for body copy. Not in script, not in pink, on a red background, nothing ridiculous like that. 
You can use PowerPoint, Keynote, Google Slides, Prezi, uh, Mentimeter is a new one I heard that sounds kind of cool. You can do like live voting on th something on a screen and get results. And Canva seems to be what people on Instagram love the, these days. You can source free stock photography. I mean, if you're doing a presentation for just like a few people that are within your business, you know, take whatever you want off Google Images. It's totally fine. But if you're doing something that's a little bit more professional or a little bit more in the public eye where you could catch some flack for stealing someone's pictures off of Google Images, you can use these free stock websites called Unsplash, Texels, and Free Pick. And there's tons more. If you just Google free stock photography, there's tons of websites that offer this. The great the first one about Unsplash and Texels is if so much Toronto-based content, so many nice shots of the CN Tower and anything else you might want like that. Uh, another little designer technique that goes perfectly with public speaking is darkening the decks. You change the focus from suddenly the screen to just you, the person standing in front of that. It's such an excellent way if you're telling a really like heart wrenching story or, or just any kind of story where you want the focus to be on you, you put into a blank slide or fade into a black slide, whatever it might be. And then suddenly the tension comes back to you. They're not looking at your logo. They're not checking your Instagram. They're not looking at your page count number in the top right corner. Think what? We're only 10 slide, 10 out of 27 is ridiculous. You want that focus on you so you could tell a personal story with people. And of course, checking your spelling, such an important thing. You don't want to have the wrong there, there, or there, or the wrong wood, wood, wood up on your screen. When you are <laughs> trying to present yourself as a professional, you're going to look real foolish. And that's why I hopefully had my mom do a spell check on this thing before I presented to you guys today. Uh, another one is don't go wild with the animations. PowerPoint, that's why I had such a problem with you for so long. You only offer the stupidest things I'd ever seen. Sound effect. You don't want lasers going off <laughs> when you are trying to <laughs> go through someone's presentation or the star swipe, star swipe. What were they thinking? What were they thinking? Um, you can create a presentation roadmap. So if you see on, on my screen as well, I've got the listing of how many slides I have. So people can kind of get a sense of like where we are, how far along are we? And it also keeps me on time as well. Okay, so let's gonna move on to the usual slides. People are like, okay, well, you said what I, what I should and what I shouldn't have, but like what, what are some like basics that you always wanna have on your PowerPoint or your presentation deck? The usual slides would be the who and the why. So introducing yourself, your name or your business name and your primary focus. Like, hi, I'm Ian Todd from Speakerbox. My primary focus is public speaking, graphic design, podcasting, workshops, events, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I do too many things actually. The what, so sharing it is what that you do. The how, how are you currently conducting your business? Do you run an Etsy store? Are you on Shopify? Do you go to farmer's markets? Do you just sell to a current client list you've built up through recommendations and friend references over the years? And the where, where do you see yourself going? People want to see that ambition. They want to find out what you're going to go to next. Like you've gotten to the $10,000 a year bracket for your early starting in, in a small art career or whatever it might be. How do you get to the 40,000? How do you get to the 60,000? How do you get to the 100,000 mark? Like, where do you want this business to go and grow? And then, of course, the most important contact information your website, your social handles, and your email. I, I'm a little bit against having phone numbers these days because no one, <laughs> I, I find very rarely will someone like be in a presentation and go, oh, ho, ho, this is good. This is real good. I'm gonna write that down. I'm gonna call that man immediately after this and thank him and then ask him 30 more questions. It's, it's very far and few in between. Even when I worked at an agency, they, oh my God, they were the worst. They'd be like, okay, we want the website, the social, the email, the phone numbers, the fax number, just in case they want to fax us anything right after this meeting. And also, could you get our postal code in there and write down Toronto, Ontario, Canada? I'm like, it's Toronto. Toronto's got enough enough hall, enough flavor to know we're from Toronto, Ontario, Canada. No, 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 you got to write Ontario. You got to write Canada. I'm like, okay, I'll, I'll give you Ontario. Okay, you can have Ontario, but I don't want to write Canada. We, or people should know. It's, we don't want to be the confused for the Ontario and San Francisco or the, I think it's Toronto. We're just going to let them know. It's, no, 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 you got to write Canada and get that postal code, the L, the 4, the E, the ridiculous ridiculous it used to drive me nuts so contact information website social email phone number if you're feeling like you want to get some weird text messages totally up to you <clears throat> so from that let's get your long story shorter let me just see where i am on my side of things <clears throat> Does anyone want to try answering in the chat how they can shorten their presentation pitch or or <clears throat> or a story 
Let's see if I can open that chat back up. Uh, where was it? Yeah, does anyone want to suggest how they could shorten their whole thing? I mean, other than putting your head down on the podium and saying no, and then running off. <laughs> nope, never mind. Going back into it. So you can edit yourself. Well, I guess let's say, let's get this in the most logical way. So to edit yourself, when you're building these presentations, these conversations, these deck, whatever it might be, sometimes you're told like, oh, you're doing a 20 minute presentation. Other times you're told, do whatever it takes to get it done kind of thing. So you can aim for three to five minutes. That is usually a perfect amount to pitch someone on your business or whatever it might be. You've heard of elevator pitch. That's like a one minute small sampling. A more realistic pitch is anywhere in the three to five minute range, or you fill three fourths of your time so you leave room for questions or gasps or reactions or whatever it might be. You ensure your presentation has only one focus. So instead of going on about how you do podcasting workshops, or sorry, it's about something like something about podcasts, workshops, graphic design, woodworking, uh, neon signs for wedding rentals. These are all the business I do, by the way, P.S. You just focus on one singular thing. You restrict the number of items in a list. So instead of saying like, here's the top 10 facts about my business. And number 10 is like, you're just like, we got a, we got a coffee maker and a pretty cold water cooler. If anyone hates lukewarm water, we don't got lukewarm water. You don't want to get down into those items that are just not as strong. Stick with your strong points, your top three, your top five, whatever it might be. You rehearse your stories. I had this... What happened to me was at my friend uh, Mike Lever's wedding, who I'm, I'm saying his name because my friend is watching on Instagram chat up here and he'll, he'll, he'll know who it is. When I went to his wedding, I was, he's like, oh, it's going to be like really chill. It's, it's in a forest. It's going to look like a, like a whole Pinterest setup out there with the, tea, or the fairy lights and everything and the, and the tables and the covers. I was like, that sounds awesome. He's like, you just make a quick little speech. I was like, cool, cool, cool. I was like, no problem. I've been on stages for years, speeches, no problem. I'm like, I'll just tell a fun little story like how we first met. And it was this great little story. but. I didn't rehearse it. I didn't, I hadn't told the story in at least four years to anyone. So when he's like, yeah, just tell like a quick little joke. I was like, cool, I got it. I know exactly what I'm going to do. But B, I did not rehearse it. So I went up there and I started talking through how we met and going through all the jokes and et cetera. And as I'm going through, I'm like, wait, wait no, first this happened, then this, then, then we, then he went into the limo, then he threw the bottle, then he did like all the wild stuff was all out of order that it didn't end up being a very strong story. The point wasn't driven across. The jokes didn't go as well because I did not rehearse it. It should have been a five minute thing at most. And I went on for 15 minutes trying to remember how it went down. It's terrible. So it showed me that rehearsing your stories makes for such a stronger way to keep yourself in focus and make sure you stick to your time limits, stick to what you have available to you and keep the focus on what is going on. And you want to give people a reason to ask you questions. So if you leave out some details, they can come and be like, well, you didn't really explain much about this. Or you could even pose questions like if you want to, or even ask them, like, if you want to know a little bit more about this little segment, come talk to me afterwards. Thus creating a little bit more for yourself to engage with people one-on-one. -on -one. Uh, let me just see what else do I have up here. Uh, yeah. Tightening your explanations. Uh, it, like I said before with that, it's so easy to start babbling. You want to rehearse your explanations, whether it means like how your business flows, how it works together, how your product gets from you to the customer, whatever it might be. Make sure you've tightened these down to just the most logical, narrow section of that so people don't have to go, oh, cool, that was a 25-minute talk about how you put something in the mailbox. That's wonderful. All right, next slide. Am I too sexy for my pitch? The most powerful visual aid is you. I'm pointing at both the screens. <laughs> you wanna let your body speak. It has a language of its very own. It can be the presenter's greatest asset and tool when you are on a stage and having that focus put on you. Movement stimulates a visible presence and energy for both the presenter and their audience. So meaningful gestures can go a very long way. <laughs> Number one being, you want to smile. You want to look like you are having a good time. I had someone ask me at event. He's like, so I just get up there. I, uh, I put my, my cue cards down. I just give him a big smile and then begin. I'm like, no, no, that sounds like you're a lunatic, like a, <laughs> a total madman. 
you want to be naturalist if you're having a good time or you're about to be having a good time because you enjoy public speaking, which no one does but me. You want to have that smile on your face. So it just shows that you're warm, you're friendly, you're kind, you're supportive. It seems so ridiculously obvious, but it is such a nice way to just kind of create that comfort level for people. You can take them there. You can use your hands to illustrate things. If you're talking about something in the past, you can take a step backward. If you're talking about something in the future, you can take a step forward. Let your hands do whatever they want. I, I like as you can see what I'm doing, right? Like I'm picking up the microphone stand. I just kind of go all over the place. Usually, if I if I had a full stage or a presentation area, I'd usually be walking all over the space <laughs> because I don't like to hide behind podiums. I don't like to stand still. Podium is like the worst nightmare for people to hide behind. They see they're like perfect, perfect. No one's gonna see me behind this thing. I'm gonna just duck really low and. No one will even notice me. Maybe they'll just leave. Like, that'll be perfect. Podium, terrible. If you can get out from behind it, that is such a better way to gain that comfort and that easiness of doing what you're doing. Uh, reminding your face. <laughs> so many speakers, they'll be like, oh, uh, speakers will say like, oh, I'm very passionate about this. I love this. But you're like, you look like you're bored out of your mind completely. Like, I just want to see that people also have that excitement in their face. You want to stand tall. If you're standing tall with your spine straight, shoulders back, and relaxed, it indicates your that you are in control. You are confident, and you know what you are doing. Don't shrink down behind that damn podium. <laughs> Project an image of confidence. Another one is you want to watch your speed. Generally speaking, slow, deliberate gestures are often associated with seriousness, whereas fast gestures are indicate excitement and enthusiasm. As you might have noticed, I go back and forth between the two of these using the cadence and the rhythm of my voice to kind of create a bit of a roller coaster of sound for you guys. So it keeps you a little bit more involved, a little bit interactive with it, or sorry, more. <clears throat> more excited about it. Projecting your voice, using your vocal tones can help. Like this is exactly what I just said. Using your vocal tones can keep people interested in listening. The loud, the quiet, the fast, the slow, it keeps people focused instead of having a monotone pace across the entire thing is just not gonna do it for anybody. And one of my favorites, use your confident clothing, your sexy underwear, your date night shirt, whatever makes you feel the most comfortable. If it's something like a dark shirt like this that hides your sweat stains, that's perfect. You can wear whatever you want to feel the best in. You wanna be looking your best when you're up there. I had a guy talk to me. He's like, he's like, he's like, I never thought about that. He's like, I, he ended up wearing a suit to his <laughs> pitch presentation when he finally finalized the thing. Like, and he was a guy that had never worn a suit unless it's for a funeral. But he looked so sharp; it made such a difference. He's like, I never would have thought about that. He's like, I never considered the clothing I wear. I thought all the content only mattered for what was going on in in my presentation. I never considered to like reflect that in what I'm wearing as well. Uh, next slide. Just don't. These are the things that you do not want to do. If anyone wants to throw some in the chat things you think you should never do in a pitch or a presentation or on a stage, let's see what we got over here. I wore an untested dress for a presentation one day and the unpredictable armpit stains were awful. So I always wear dark stuff now. <laughs> Thank you, Natalie, <laughs> for sharing that. But it's true, like, I, I usually wear brighter colors. I mean, I don't care if I got sweat stains. I, I totally will own them when I'm up on the stage, but it doesn't matter to me. I get so comfortable with them. I'm like, yeah, look at these. No big deal. Like, you're going to sweat. You're getting nervous. I've been on stages hundreds of times, and it still will happen to me. Um, yeah, does anyone on this uh, what you should not do on a stage? Sweating is totally fine on stage, by the way. Anyone at all in the lovely chat. Don't be a hunchback. <laughs> Don't freeze up. <laughs> a hunchback. Yeah, if you start just slowly curving over and looking at the floor, it's going to be a weird thing. Don't swear. Yes, thank you. Don't wear uncomfortable heels. Very excellent point. Uncomfortable shoe. I don't know why anyone even buys an uncomfortable shoe. If it's in the store, it hurts your feet. Why would you buy that? I have to watch with gestures, and if not, careful, it is super distracting. It looks like I'm trying to swat something. So he's, he's over the top with his hands. Don't read off a script. 
Uh, don't use too many ums and uhs. Careful with the hair. <laughs> These are great. Okay, I'm going to flip back into the screen share and give you guys my list of things you, you just don't want to do. Number one, you don't want to stand. I'm going to just do them too. You don't want to stand with your legs crossed. You don't want to pace up and down because you look like the Unabomber. It's like a psycho move to pace up and down. You don't want to point with your finger the entire time or use the finger guns on people. Weird, weird, weird. Don't do that. You want to open, like, put open palms with your hand, like, yes, you over there, you, you in the living room on the laptop over there. How's it going? You don't want to sway from side to side because it seems like you're a 10 year old who has to go to the bathroom. And you don't want to lean on something. One of the mistakes I once made and made several more times since then was leaning on something. I was like, I just feeling really cocky and confident. I was like, yeah, yeah, don't lean on something. I placed my hand on what I assumed was the wall because it was from floor to ceiling, but that was a giant wooden slider that was covering a window. So when I said, don't lean on something, I then leaned on it. And then I fell over, tumbled into my signage and knocked over the projector. It was absolutely nightmare, ridiculous, so stupid. <laughs> I was at another show in, in Markham once and I leaned on the microphone stand. I put my arm on it as an armrest for some reason and the entire thing just collapsed and I was talking to the floor at that point. You don't want to read from the screen. So like I said before, your screen, it should not be a script for you. You don't want to be quiet. You don't want to be so quiet that people can't hear you and that they say what a whole bunch of times. And then by then they go, you know, I'm not even going to listen because I cannot hear this person. You want to speak clearly, speak loudly, anything like that. And don't avoid eye contact when you, it's hard to do like when you first get on stages or start presenting and talking face to face with people, it's very hard to make that eye contact because it makes you so uncomfortable. But when you master that, when you can look them in the eye, it no longer feels like you're doing this presentation for a room full of people. It's like you're having a one-on-one -on -one conversation with just the one person in front of you. And that makes it so much more easier for me and for you as well, hopefully. <clears throat> Next slide. For anyone up there in the Instagram uh, live, I, I can't see anything you're writing. <laughs> Uh, all, ki <clears throat> all killer, no filler. You want to watch your language. The most seasoned, talented, presentable obviously throw in the occasional um, er, uh, obviously, actually, likely, so, basically. Even myself, I, I'll, I'll get caught up saying one word and then I start catching it and then I can't stop doing it. I was at an event recently. I just kept saying basically over and over and over and over and over and it drove me absolutely, basically nuts. So if you suffer from these afflictions and constantly using these types of words, here's a few solutions you can use. You open up your phone, look for the voice recording app, and hit record. When you play that back, it's going to be the most painful thing in your life. You're going to say, that's not my voice. I don't sound like that. That's not really what I sound like. Sorry to say your voice is actually that nasally, but when you play that back, you'll be able to hear these ums, the likes, the ers, and you can start cutting them out or finding the spots where you keep saying that, where you're, where you're struggling, where you're, you're, you're falling. You can even do a little method where you have someone make little ticks on a piece of paper, having a friend put ticks on the page for each error they catch. And afterwards you see, oh, 25 ticks, pretty terrible. And you keep practicing at it until you get a little bit better at it. Uh, slowing down makes a huge difference as well. These filler words are often associated with your nerves and are triggered by that. So when you start to slow down and practice slowing your pace and taking breaths in between your sentences, suddenly it becomes a lot easier to get that information across. Throwing in a pause every now and again, a timely pause makes such a difference too and adds greater effect to statements and allows you to catch a moment to breathe or to rest. That time feels so much faster when you're stressed out and people get stressed out when they are in front of an audience like this. So when you give yourself little pauses, we had done a, um, a pausing exercise at a workshop where I was at a little while ago where they asked you to essentially come up with your, your life motto, a statement about yourself and then you would then share that with people. But then you have to put a pause. So like, like mine was uh, seven words. It was the best things in life are on the other side of fear, which was something Will Smith said, and I'm sure he stole it off of Nelson Mandela or someone else. But the best things in life are on the side of fear. When you put the pause in between different spots of that, it totally changes the weight of it. So the best things in life are on the other side of fear. The best things in life are on the other side of fear. 
it kind of gives a little bit more flavor to that and finding ways to put those into your speeches gives it such a little bit more weight to it. And like I said before, practice, a well-rehearsed becomes second, or a well-rehearsed pitch becomes second nature. When I usually do my performances of either poetry or storytelling or whatever, I have everything broken up into like little chunks. And so that way it's so much more easier for me to memorize. So when I become like a memorize a performance or whatever it might be, it just becomes second nature in the sense that I'm just going, oh, like piece one, piece two, piece three, piece four. And people could stop, they could interrupt me, they could whatever they want throw bottles at me while I'm on the stage and I could pick it right back up because I have everything in those little segments that's kind of stuck in my head. So I, I've even had people tell me they, they learn their performances backwards. They'll do each chunk in reverse so that way they could start and stop at any given point and know the information and it gets stronger as they go through something. Next slide. How much for a shot of some sweet, sweet confidence? I used to think that having a drink before getting on a stage or doing something that made me nervous would calm my nerves and it maybe did for a time. And then I stopped doing that because I went to an event in Montreal, a room of 200 people. I got up to perform. I had a shot. I had two beers. It would seem like such a wonderful Sunday evening. And I dropped what I was talking about. I totally flopped. Everything went out my head and out the window and I was standing there in front of these people. They're all looking at me like, yes, yes, and please more. I'm like, uh, I don't know what to say and I'm going to leave. And I just walked off the stage totally embarrassed and was like, yeah, that's it. Bye. Uh, it was ridiculous. I, the drinking slowed my tongue. I couldn't speak as quick. I couldn't speak as clearly. I didn't feel that confidence anymore because it just made me screw things up. So if you're looking for ways to boost your confidence when you are doing any kind of type of performance or anything like that, here are some confidence boosters. You can reframe that nervousness as excitement. You can rehearse the opening. That's like one of my favorite quotes, by the way. Rehearse that nervous, re, 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 reframe that nervousness as excitement. So instead of saying like, oh, like I'm just dreading doing this, you get that excitement. So suddenly it feels like you have the opportunity, something you don't get every single day. And now you get a chance to do this. It's such a, a better experience for you. Uh, rehearsing the opening lines. I keep notes in my pocket. Oh, I've got it all on my screen now, so it's a lot easier for me. But I always would keep my notes in my pocket. So if I forget any key element or I just completely blank, I can go, hold on one sec. No big deal. Doesn't matter to me. I got them all in my pocket. But rehearsing the opening lines for my pitch or my performance or whatever always is a better way for me to keep it in mind in that sense that it just lets the rest of it fall into place when I can rehearse those opening lines. Not alienating yourself. So when you're at events and you're sitting in a room and everyone's on their phone and just kind of hanging out waiting for something to begin, I will engage people. I will talk to them. Just get a little conversation going because it makes you feel a little bit more comfortable so that you're not sitting there in dread until it's your turn to get on stage or your turn to do your presentation or your turn to do whatever. Just having that little bit more comfort. You already know the information. This is your business. This is your pitch. This is your whatever. You already have that confidence within you. But if you sit there letting it stew, you're going to feel so uncomfortable and it's going to make it just worse. So don't alienate yourself. Have a conversation. Hang out. Enjoy it. Or enjoy the people you're around. Uh, one of my favorite tips is diffuse the stage. And that means when everyone is at the beginning having these little conversations and not alienating themselves and they're all sitting on their phones or whatever, you can step beside the stage or step on the stage or the front of the room or whatever it might be. And just to kind of get a sense of what it's like to be in that spot so that when you return to that space, you feel a little more comfortable and confident with that kind of place. That way you're feeling like, oh, I've already been up here. I can, I can come up here again. I already, this carpet belongs to me. I already rubbed my shoes in it. That's fine. This is your stage now. So always try and diffuse the stage so you just get a little bit more comfortable with yourself. Uh, like I said before, dress to impress. Wear whatever you're going to wear on your date night. That's what you want to wear to get that little bit of confidential boost for yourself. And practice and prepare. That's such a key element. And it's something that everyone says. You got to practice. You got to be prepared. When you run these things over, either with people or by yourself, you just have that little bit more confidence when you actually know the content. And if you forget something, like I said before, you've got your notes to back you up. And the last one is don't wait your turn. Take your turn. 
it drives me nuts to see people at parties or whatever it might be, and there's a conversation happening, and they don't put their opinion into it. They just sit there, listen to everyone else's, and then they go, oh, I, I wanted to say something, but I, it didn't feel like it was my turn or whatever. You have to take your turn. Life is not always going to say, okay, now what's your business idea? Okay, what's your opinion on this? Okay, you have to put your voice into the conversation. You have to get involved. So don't wait your turn. Take your turn. And the most important tip of all, number one or number two best tip, find a toilet, use it, abuse it, then flush it down. Having to go to the washroom before you have to get up on a stage is the most uncomfortable feeling. It means you're going to rush things through. You're not paying attention. You start sweating bullets, whatever it might be. Go to the bathroom before you have to do a presentation. It's the most important thing. All right, next slide. Where am I on this thing? But, 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 I'm scared. Ian, I've never been on a stage before. Ian, I don't know what I'm doing. Ian, I'm a liar and all my information is totally false. I just stole from a guy I found outside in the parking lot. Don't worry, I'm gonna get you through this. Here's a couple stage fright tips. One of the easier ones, skip your morning coffee or latte. You don't want that extra jitter. If you drink seven Cokes in the parking lot before you get on, perform or do your pitch or whatever, you're gonna be rattled up like a sugar baby. Treat it like a conversation, not a presentation. Presentations, they remind you of grade school. They remind you of doing public school speeches. They make you sweat bullets. I'm sweating bullets just thinking about those. They're terrible. But when you treat it like a conversation, like you just happen to have a little bit of knowledge that you want to share with other people, suddenly it makes it a lot more easier for you. And you have to remember that people are not here to see you. Most of the time, they are here for the information. They don't know who you are until you've introduced yourself. Other ways you can kind of steady yourself up. So when you see people shaking the paper, doing 10 push-ups backstage or, or in, your, in the parking lot or wherever just kind of helps steady your hand. My friend, she was a manager, and she said she used to do it all the time. She would do a few push-ups before any meeting so that way she's not rattling the paper in her hands. What else do we have on here? Relaxing your body one part at a time, your face, your jaw, your neck, shoulders, arms, hands, stomach, thighs, knees, and then wiggle your toes. I used to think that was a joke. I was like, there's no way I'm going to wiggle my toes and try and run through my body and relax. And then I started doing it. It really does put a serene calm over you. It makes you feel a little bit more chill when you're doing this kind of stuff. Um, you want to establish a, so another stage fright tip is you want to establish a connection with your audience. So that means you're greeting, eye contact, your task, a game, asking a direct question. Who's excited to be here tonight? And they might go, woo, and you go, woo is not an answer. And they go, oh, okay. You just want to get people involved. You can either ask for a round of applause, whether it be like, oh, a round of applause for a host tonight or round of applause for yourselves for coming out here during the snowstorm. A round of applause for hanging out with us tonight on chat, even though there's a COVID nightmare going on. Anything to kind of engage people in the beginning gets that focus on you, gives you a little bit more comfort, get that round of applause going, the tasks, icebreakers, whatever it might be. And the best stage tip of all, right here, keeping water with you. It means I don't get that weird dry mouth sound that you can hear on microphone times. You're like, oh my God, this guy's got a desert in his mouth going on over there. What is happening? Having the water with you also gives you natural pause break. Anything like that helps a little bit more with the comfort level up there. Mm -hmm. uh, don't expect encouragement or validation. I've done tons of shows where I put my whole heart on the stage. I gave everything I had and no one said anything. 200 people in a room, not a single person said, hey, good job, or hey, I liked what you said, or hey, you really spoke to me with that. You kind of have to get used to that kind of thing. People are not always going to care about what you are presenting and what you are talking about. But sometimes you will find that one person who connects with you. They, they had the same traumas they went through or they had the similar experiences. And those are the ones that are going to mean the most to you. Those are the ones you're never going to forget. So don't always expect it. But when you do get it, 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 it can be a beautiful thing. And learning to receive feedback, the positive, the negative, the neutral, so much neutral feedback. Did you like it? Yeah, it was a thing. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm -mm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Nothing, no help whatsoever. But even negative feedback, like it, it's very easy to get upset with that kind of thing when you get negative feedback and they're like, no, you're, you're actually wrong. Uh, I am the best, sorry. 
but sometimes you can learn from that. So taking that and trying to have a, a better perspective on that kind of stuff. Um, let's see over here. And of course, another fantastic stage fright tip is go first. If you are super nervous, you're sitting in that chair for the next three hours waiting to go, or they cancel it and they move yours to day two, go first if you have that chance. If you have that opportunity, go first, get it over and done with, set that bar so everyone else has to eat your dust. Next slide. Enjoy the ride. So this means, to me, not taking yourself too seriously or lightening up and having fun, helping your audience do the same. As you can see the whole way through as I'm, I'm making jokes, I'm hanging out, I'm just enjoying myself. This is not a strenuous thing for me. I'm just lightening up. I'm enjoying it as we go through it. And enjoying the opportunity experience because not everyone gets a chance to do a presentation in front of good people. Not everyone gets a chance to pitch someone who might want to invest in their business. Not everyone has a chance to explain what the hell they're working on these days. So when you get these opportunities, take them for what they are and enjoy these things. And of course, never insult your audience. Oh my goodness. I wish I had taught this one to my friend a few years ago. So I had booked um, a group of performers into an event for a summer. And it happened to fall on a day where it was 45 degrees. So instead of the 20,000 people they expected, they had maybe 3,000 people show up to the entire event, which means everyone spread it around the grounds. So my friend got on stage thinking he'd have a, a full house to perform to. There was maybe 50 people eating picnics and barely watching and having kids run around. And he immediately felt it was like a, a diss towards him. So he started making fun of like the fact that no one's here and no one cares about this township and da 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 and the audience didn't pay any attention. They didn't even realize because they weren't even really listening to him whatsoever. But the person who was listening was the person who booked him, the person I was into contact with, the person I said, this is the man you want to book. He's a great performer. They're like, cool, cool, cool. And then they see him go up there and immediately insult the whole a festival, the event, the organizers, all the work they had done. It was not a good look. And he never got to play that place again. And it destroyed the relationship I had with that. So never insult your audience. Even when they look like they don't give a damn, they're not paying any attention, they do not care, they dislike you, you do not want to attack your audience. It's never going to go well for you. Just play it for what it is and get through it. Next slide. You are a perfect storm, bright like lightning and loud like thunder. You want your great presentation to be exactly like candidate fireworks, where you save the very best for the end. Your amazing fireworks should be, let me slide change so it all makes sense, a return to your opening story with the new information they gained throughout your pitch. This is exactly how every major film franchise is done. A little bit beginning. What the hell's going on? Then the story begins. I know what's going on. Then the end. Now it makes sense. Thank you, every movie ever. Or you can end with a slogan, a statement. So... Whatever that might be applying to your business, uh, you can invite them to speak with you after creating that secondary conversation so you can really drive home the sales or create that bond with people or whatever you were trying to accomplish. Having the conversation afterwards is such a greater benefit to connect with these people. Avoiding yes, no decisions. You could ask an either or question. So instead of saying like, do you want this product? Yes or no? They'd be like, no. You'd be like, okay, I'm leaving. Bye. You could ask them now that you've already, or sorry, now that You've been informed about this product. Do you want option A that costs $5,000 a year? Or do you want option B for big ballers that cost $10,000 a year? And you'll look extra cool in front of everyone right now. That way you kind of line them up to already be doing a yes. And then it's a yes with you want ketchup or you want mustard. Actually, that would have made more sense to ask. Ketchup or mustard. You create a time-sensitive offer. Create urgency, a discounted deal, or a call to action. I watched my friend do a whole Instagram uh, workshop the other day at the very end of it. She's like, if you want to know more details, more, more uh, secrets of Instagram, how to like, create this and get even better with this, I have a course. Usually it's 300 bucks. Today only $30 for the next two hours or whatever her uh, time sensitive offer was. I immediately booked it because I was like, I don't want to pay 300 bucks, but I do have 30 bucks. <laughs> so creating that little bit of urgency gets people a smaller timeline to react. So that way they don't have to take down your email address and your postal code and your fax number and get a hold of you in three years from now and then go, I do want that thing you said about. And of course, final words, your name 
and a thank you. Always clear things to go. Who the hell was I listening to this entire time? My name's Ian Ta. What's up? How's it going? And a thank you, which I'm going to get to, by the way. You'll see that coming up very shortly. Um, another one is a great one is just memorizing your outro. So just like your introduction, having a strong memorized outro that includes like your slogan, your statement, powerful quote, how the purchase will benefit your customer, questions that could be answered in a follow, whatever it might be. Having that information memorized makes it just as clear and strong as your beginning was. Um, cool. So we're going to get into some questions and answers for people that are in the Zoom chat over here. If you're on the Instagram live, I can't see that far away. But yeah, any questions or, or questions, throw them in the chat and I'll answer them for you guys. And of course, I want to say once again, thank you one more time to Arts of Tobacco for sponsoring this, for having me come on and work with you guys today. It's been a lot of fun for me. I'm going to take a sip of water and then we'll get into whatever questions you got. You could also voice in your conversation. Uh, I don't know. Can they do it on here? I don't know, throw it in the chat or throw it on with your voice, whatever you want. Uh, do you consider okay, is- no questions. I'm I have a question. Eat some brownies while I wait for you guys to come up with questions. Like what kind of brownie that is? <coughs> uh, can you hear me? Can you hear me? <laughs> no? <laughs> oh what i can't hear you oh okay oh i think oh because i'm on recording mode i can't hear you guys at all if anyone's speaking through the thing that's probably why because it's said to just record myself so i guess throw your questions in the chat and i can uh, answer them on this way While I wait for any question, who is my favorite speaker? Thank you. Um, oh, man. I, I'd probably say comedians, really, because they always have such strong opinions and come up with some clever ideas. So I think it was Chris Rock years ago in one of his stand-ups talked about the more logical thing to do instead of gun control would be up the price of bullets so people aren't killing each other as much because it would cost too much to buy the thing to do that. I thought that was hilarious. I always loved ideas like that. So comedians for me are often some of my favorite speakers. Hello, Ian. Are you able to hear me? This is basically the end of the presentation. You guys can throw any questions you want now. The last part is just like a little promotional item. Can you exit the recording mode and make everyone the sample pitch except for me? What? Can you exit recording mode? Yeah, I can exit recording mode. 